Lord Fowler, I just want to ask you, um, before we leave the topic of the public education campaign, uh, about a handful of, of interactions uh, with the Prime Minister, um, Mrs Thatcher. Uh, if we could start by looking at JEVA 000, so five zeros, if I've got that right, Chairman, nine six. Now, this is a document dated the 26th of September 1985, and it's an, it's an internal um, document, I think, to, to number 10, so not something you'd have seen, I, I imagine, at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a refer reference date. David Willits has suggested that the Prime Minister may like to open the £30 million blood products laboratory at Elstree next year. Um, the lab will ensure that haemophilics can be supplied from our own pure sources with special blood plasma to protect them from becoming innocent victims of AIDS. I suggested the Prime Minister discuss this at the next diary meeting, and she agreed. My own feeling on this is that the Prime Minister should stay clear of AIDS, exclamation mark, even when it is a question of opening laboratories to help innocent victims. I think this is all something for Norman Fowler. If she is going to do a medical visit, I should prefer to suggest opening a hospital or a home for children with incurable diseases, etc. Furthermore, I do not think we could entertain the idea of a visit to Elstree, where the lab is, without combining it with something else. Um, do, do, you, do you know why um, there appears to have been a feeling in number 10 that the Prime Minister should stay clear of AIDS? <coughs> can you show me who it's from? It's from, um, if we go down to the bottom of the page, Mark Addison, uh, uh, yeah. private secretary. Yeah. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> they knew perfectly well what her attitude uh, uh, to AIDS was. In a sense, all he's doing is replaying what her attitude uh, is. And um, uh, I, doubt, I doubt if it required very much persuasion on his part uh, to uh, uh, argue against her uh, going to Elstree. Uh, David Willits, on the other hand, is a different kettle of fish. And um, he, he was much more independent of uh, number, one, number 10. I think he was an advisor at that time of, of one kind or another. It was a good idea. What a good idea it would have been had she, uh, had she, had she done it. But I think that uh, it, just <clears throat> it just portrays uh, um, some of the reservations I have about the attitudes coming out of number 10 at that time. Uh, and then specifically in the context of the, um, the public education campaign, if we then go to JEVA 5097... And if we could start with the second page, please, Shomik. This is a letter from you directly to the Prime Minister in March of 1986. Um, uh, the Somalia correspondence, as we can see from the opening paragraph, I'm, I'm not, not taking you to all of it, uh, but in, wi in which reservations about the proposed yeah. AIDS advertisements are, the, are, are, are <clears throat> set out. Um, and you explain you recognise some of the material in the proposed advertisements might shock some people. Indeed, the Chief Medical Officer's introduction admits as much, but the advertisements are intended to deal with a grave and unprecedented problem involving a potentially lethal infection which is already spreading outside the original high-risk groups to women and children, given there's no vaccine and no cure. The only option open is public education. Um, and then um, you um, say in the bottom paragraph, uh, that you've considered in light of your anxieties how our advertisements might be modified. I have to say that our room for manoeuvre is small. For example, unless there's a reference to anal intercourse, which has been linked with 85% of AIDS cases so far, the advertisement would lose all its medical authority and credibility. Not only should we be criticised for dodging the issue, but it's certain the media would start to ferret out what the advertisements have lost along the way and why. Um, and then over the page you talk about this being one of the ways in which AIDS spreads. Um, and then in the next paragraph, you have suggestions to offer about, about the, the part of the advertisement that refers to risky sex. Um, and then if we go further down the page, you say, subject, this is the penultimate paragraph, subject to the suggestions I've made, which I hope you'll find helpful, I see no alternative to proceeding with publication this coming weekend. Um, and then if we just go to the first page of this document, we can see what I think is a response... Um, to it 
Um, Mr Fowler's office tells me the minute below follows a long meeting this morning between Mr Fowler and Mr Hayhoe Brownis, Trumpet and Kenstone, the Chief Medical Officer, at which they concluded after much agonising that the proposed advertisement would lose much of the effect of the passage of risky sex was omitted. Mr Fowler's therefore proposed some quite small amendments, which I've marked up. Um, and then the question in the next paragraph, are you content with the draft advertisement as amended? And then what is presumably the Prime Minister's response um, in handwriting saying yes. Um, this isn't the only exchange that you have, I think, with number 10 on the, yeah. on the issue. But is this, is this an example of the kind of difficulties that your statement describes in, in getting the message um, that, that you wanted to publish, endorsed by, by your political colleagues? Um, it, it is the difficulty that I had with number 10. There's no question with Margaret Thatcher. I had a, 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 that difficulty um, uh, with her. I mean, it goes back to the risky sex um, uh, argument that we had previously, uh, which is an even more dramatic um, example of it. Her own concern on this, I was just thinking about this, her own concern on this was actually a rather odd concern. It was that if young people uh, read the warnings, um, um, they would be introduced to things that they had uh, never heard about, um, which might well have been the case. But the implication was that if they'd heard about it, if they'd been introduced to them, they would race away and do them. Um, but there was absolutely zero evidence of that. And never at any stage was there any evidence of that. Um, and I think she just got that entirely wrong. It was quite near to the concerns of um, the chief rabbi, who also was an unhelpful uh, part of this, uh, um, uh, this parade, um, uh, but um, uh, who, also, who also felt that uh, uh, it was um, spreading information uh, to uh, people who up to that moment knew nothing about the um, issue as well. So, you know, we did fight on several, um, uh, several fronts, but the fact that the Prime Minister was well known to be a sceptic uh, on all this, of course, uh, supported, managed to support uh, a whole range of, uh, of uh, other sceptics, including, obviously, the Treasury, who, uh, who weren't... Uh, who weren't beyond taking advantage of that uh, uh, division in the ranks. And then if I can just pick up one further um, reference to a meeting you had with the Prime Minister at WITN 0771162. This is November of 1986 um, and it's from yeah. um, uh, number 10 to uh, the Department of Health, I think, because um, it says the Prime Minister had a meeting yesterday with the Lord President, your Secretary of State, which I think is a reference to you, the Minister of Health, yeah. and Sir Donald Atchison to discuss the problem of AIDS. Um, and, and then we see the bottom of the page. Um, it says in conclusion the Prime Minister agreed with Mr Fowler that it was very important to maintain a balance between preventing the spread of the disease um, and, and causing panic. Um, you, you've um, exhibited a, a diary entry of yours um, at what I think is probably WITN 0771163. Yes. Um, where you say a 30-minute briefing of the Prime Minister on AIDS prior to Cabinet. I take along Donald Atchison. It goes well. She asks good questions and shows a wide understanding of the disease and what should be done to prevent its spread. Um, can you recall... Uh, and we can take that down, thank you. C can you recall um, whether there was uh, um, ever any discussion between you and the Prime Minister about the particular plight of those infected through their NHS treatment? I'm sure there was, but I wouldn't like to be able to. I wouldn't like to be able to put my finger on when it was. I mean, we talked on the we talked on the whole area. That was that was quite a good meeting that we had there, and she was on best behaviour and um, asked very good questions. Um, and um, you know, uh, she 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 operated as a scientist, uh, which of course she was. 
Um, and um, uh, that was quite useful. Didn't, I'm afraid, uh, change her underlying views about the subject. Um, and I'm going to come next to ask you a little bit about the issue of compensation. Yeah. And the consideration that was given to that. But c can you recall ever having a discussion yourself with the Prime Minister on that issue? On compensation? Yes. I don't think I did. Um, so if we then just pick up um, what was said about compensation um, from 1985 through to 1987 when um, you then left the department, we start with PRSE 30350, please. So this is... Um, February 1985, and if we look at the bottom half of the page, right-hand column, um, just below the heading about um, Depot Prevera, Prevera um, it says, Mr. Kenneth Clark, no, just above that, please show me, the paragraph above that. There's a question from Mr. Chope. Um, he asked the Secretary of State for Social Services if he has any plans to offer compensation to persons who contract AIDS as a result of receiving contaminated blood supply by the NHS. And then the answer from um, Mr. Clark is, there's only a very remote chance of contracting AIDS from ordinary blood transfusions. And then this, there's never been a general state scheme to compensate those who suffer the unavoidable adverse effects which can unhappily arise from many medical procedures. And we'll see that phrase about unavoidable adverse effects appears more than once in, um, in what's said by ministers or by the department. Do, do you think that's an apt way, a fair way, to characterise infection with a, an incurable disease with a high mortality rate? Uh, unavoidable adverse effects? No, I think that... Uh, um, I think... I mean, it probably was Ken's view, but uh, it was also very much the Treasury view that uh, um, um, that uh, we should uh, avoid any plans to offer compensation. And various ministers uh, expressed that in uh, different ways. And I think rather than textually analysing the way that ministers did it, one should remember that that was the general policy. It was a policy uh, laid down uh, um, uh, by the Treasury that we weren't going to offer compensation uh, to uh, uh, people who contracted AIDS in that way. And the um, uh, reason for, the, for that, uh, or excuse you might say, for that uh, policy um, uh, was that there'd never been a uh, no-fault uh, scheme, no uh, general state scheme to uh, 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 compensate. I think what that avoided was the fact uh, which made, again, which made this uh, a situation uh, with haemophiliacs different, was that we were dealing here with a, uh, a, a new disease. It wasn't a, a question that uh, someone had been uh, uh, deficient or, or uh, um, there, there had been uh, some kind of fault in dealing with it. The fact was that people were exploring how they could actually uh, deal with it. Um, and um, uh, for, for many, it, uh, it, 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 it was OK. But for some, it wasn't anything but OK. But I think, to, um, I think the trouble was that the, uh, the Treasury, and again, I come back to the Treasury, the Treasury never went past that uh, particular point. They just said there's never been a general scheme. And if we allow this one to go through, uh, then we're going to have all kinds of uh, claims um, 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 on the Treasury. Um, and you know, that, was their, that was their view. But they never, they never looked at the, um, the point about AIDS or indeed the point uh, uh, about haemophiliacs with, with, with AIDS. Uh, because this, we were in an area of unknown. It's rather foolish, I think, to start uh, talking about culpability uh, in that kind of area. If we just move on a year to 1986 to DHSC 
This is a letter from Baroness Trumpington, who was now the Minister with Responsibility for Blood and Blood Products, March of 1986, um, to um, an MP um, who has clearly raised a number of, of issues. And if we just look at the bottom paragraph, does the government have the deepest sympathy for the plight of haemophiliacs? However, there's never been a general state scheme to compensate those who suffer the unavoidable adverse effects, which can in rare cases unhappily arise from some medical procedures. Compensation is awarded by the courts in cases where negligence has been proved. It would, of course, be improper to prejudge any case which a haemophiliac might bring, but no suggestion has been made that the doctors treating haemophiliacs have acted negligently before the availability of heat-treated factor VIII. The possible risks of unheated factor VIII had to be weighed against the effects on the lives of haemophiliacs of ceasing to have treatment. And then this sentence, which is what I wanted to ask you about, Lord Fowler. Doctors treating haemophiliacs were, we believe, careful in explaining these risks to their patients. Now, that's, that's an articulation of a, a positive belief held on the part of the department that doctors carefully explained risks, the risks to their patients. Right. The evidence the inquiry has heard is very much to the, to the contrary, Lord Fowler, but if this is to appear in a, in a letter from the, the, the minister responsible on behalf of the department, should there have been some inquiry or investigation before setting out a, a, a positive affirmation of that kind? And if so, do you know whether one was undertaken? Yes, I don't know where that uh, uh, phrase came from. Um, uh, Lady Trumpington, at the time, I don't think was the minister responsible, was she, for, for blood? I think she was. For blood products? Yes. Right. We, we can check, but I think... Yeah, OK. Um, if she was, she was pretty new, uh, new to it. I think most ministers would have uh, queried that particular, uh, uh, particular sentence. Um, I think the even more basic thing here, here is, which affected, which affected everyone, affected all haemophiliacs, is the idea that um, negligence had to be proved. Well, that's all very well if you're dealing with a well-established uh, disease um, um, where you know, a doctor has made, I don't know, uh, a, a fundamental mistake. I don't quite see in the medical treatment of a a HIV uh, and AIDS, how you can actually pinpoint uh, negligence. I don't think, I, I can't think of anyone who was trying to do it negligently. Uh, what they were trying to do uh, was to find a way of treating this unknown uh, disease. And again, I come back to the point, you know, in the early 80s, we didn't even know it was a virus. Um, so I, it, it, it's, it's a, it, that is a much more fundamental um, um, error, I think, in, in our uh, attitude. And it meant that we should have looked at the whole thing rather more uh, constructively and rather more widely uh, than we did, uh, frankly. And um, uh, that was a... Uh, Mistake, <laughs> not a, just a mistake uh, uh, for the Conservative government, but also for the following Labour government. Uh, I remember the Labour minister uh, saying to me that she uh, went on to uh, uh, went on to parliamentary uh, parliamentary questions and was told under no circumstances to admit that any fault had been had, had been uh, had been shown. Well, I mean, there's a lack of frankness uh, in what medical. Um, knowledge there was um, uh, at different stages about HIV and AIDS. It just didn't exist. And how you made a, how you made a, <laughs> how you could actually say that someone had been negligent, very difficult to tell. Uh, uh, just, just following it through with, um, with my reference to a, an observation apparently setting out um, the, the Treasury perspective. Yeah. At DHSC 0014947 underscore 034, <coughs> this is a minute of the 15th of January 1987 from an RF2 to, to Mr. Harris. Um, it, it, it refers to an earlier minute which you've also exhibited, but I don't think we need to go to that. 
Says at paragraph two, you can expect strong treasury objections to any suggestion that a special compensation scheme should be set up for haemophiliacs because of repercussions for other medical accidents. The Treasury have given approval to medical compensation arrangements in very restricted circumstances. This is where the medical risk is assessed as being so slight that it virtually does not exist and where there is a special motive. An example of the latter has been the Treasury's recent approval for compensation arrangements in respect of clinical trials on a new whooping cough vaccine at the PHLS of PHLSB. This was agreed on the grounds it was desirable to encourage the proposed clinical trials and the risk involved was considered to be negligible. Um, it may well be this is a question that has to be posed to the Treasury rather than to you, Lord Fowler, but are you able to understand, uh, assist us in understanding what's being said in that second paragraph, which is, appears to be the Treasury have, will, will approve compensation arrangements only in cases where the risk is so small it virtually doesn't exist. Yeah. In other words, one never have to pay out. Is, is, is that the right way to read it? I don't know. It's a very convoluted uh, argument. I mean, the real thing is that they, the um, Treasury had uh, objected to any suggestion that a special compensation scheme should be set up for haemophiliacs uh, because of the repercu repercussions, not, well, for other medical accidents. It wasn't repercussions for that. It was that it was set a precedent uh, for um, other claims. That was their fear. Um, and I think the rest is um, uh, high-class plan, really. Um, if we go to SCGV five zeros one four underscore zero four four. This is a letter um, uh, passing on to Lord Glenartha. A letter from Dr. Ludlam, who was a Haemophilia Reference Centre Director in Edinburgh. If we go over the page, um, it, it, it's a letter which, um, in turn, refers to, a, refers to and encloses a copy of a letter published in the Times by Dr. Peter Jones, outlining the case for yeah. compensation for haemophiliacs. And if we go to the third page, we'll see Dr. Jones's letter. Um, he talks in the first paragraph about how HIV has added an intolerable burden to the lives of many families with yeah. husbands or sons already incapacitated by haemophilia. He refers in the second paragraph to a hope that time will be found to consider the special needs of these families. And then um, talks about difficulties with insurance and mortgage. And then the last paragraph, he says this, I believe that these families form a well-defined group with a special call for state help. In the case of haemophilia, the government should argue neither precedent nor an open-ended commitment because of the atrogenic nature of infection and the small and finite numbers involved. It would be of great, immense and great and immediate benefit if some form of no-fault compensation should be provided to them. Um, um, and I, there's certainly, I think, I'm not sure whether Dr. Jones's letter made its way directly to you, but um, uh, there's a letter, um, L-O-T-H, Six zeros nine underscore zero two two. Which suggests um, a further correspondence from Dr. Ludlam was was passed on to you. I, I mean, li leaving that in a sense to, to, to one side, the the case that was being articulated by some of the haemophilia clinicians to regard those infected. As a, as a special case, not least because of the route of infection through their NHS treatment. Was, was that ever substantively considered by the department, w with or without the Treasury, during your time, your remaining time in office, which I think was now a, a few further months? Um, so what, 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 what would, was what considered? So the, 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 the case that was being put forward by, by, we see Dr Jones and Dr Ludlam, for compensation... Um, or some form of special support for, for haemophiliacs infected with HIV. Was that and those arguments ever substantively considered um, by you, as far as you can recall, in, in, the, in the remaining months of your time at the department? I, I think uh, it, it, we may have talked about it, but I think uh, it, was, uh, it was a doom to failure. Um, there was no chance that uh, I was going to get uh, permission to do that. Uh, no chance whatsoever. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Treasury were against it. 
prime minister would have been against it because it would have, uh, she would have been told that it would uh, have other uh, uh, effects. I can't think of anyone, with the exception of you know, one or two members of the cabinet, who might just have been in, might just have had some sympathy. It was, um, uh, it was a hopeless case, I'm afraid, because every, they took in the view um, that if we agreed to this, um, then the floodgates would be open. That was the argument. And it was as, um, uh, as, uh, as crude as that, I'm afraid. If we just then um, go to a couple more documents on, on this issue, DHSC 00001383. This is a minute um, dated the 17th of February 1987 from Dr. Smithers to Mr. Harris. Yeah. Um, and we can say, um, she says in the second uh, sentence, some background information about the treatment of haemophilia may help to provide uh, perspective to the question of whether or not haemophiliacs have a special case for compensation for the tragedy of having had the AIDS virus transmitted to them as a result of their treatment. Uh, and then if we go over the page, she, she sets out various matters. I'm not going to go through the, the detail of it. I just wanted to ask you, um, before we return to the question of compensation, about what she says at the top of that second page, transmission of infection. She talks there about, in 1974, recognised in the UK that hepatitis was being transmitted for the use of commercial factor VIII concentrates, um, and it describes non A, non B hepatitis. About halfway down that paragraph, she says a chronic hepatitis may develop, which may proceed to cirrhosis. And then the next paragraph, apart from non-A, non-B hepatitis, there are a number of viral infections which may be transmitted through unheated coagulation factors. Um, I just flag that up because I then want to ask you to look at the third page. Under the heading compensation, she says, it seems likely we have a finite number of haemophiliacs who've contracted HIV infection. Their position is pitiful and has attracted great sympathy, in particular because of the perceived stigma of the disease which is associated with promiscuous sexual activity. The equally sad fact that a number of haemophiliacs will undoubtedly die of chronic hepatitis as a result of non-A, non-B infection has not been recognised publicly. Now, just, just pausing there, Lord Fowler, obviously much of my questioning has focused on, on AIDS mm. because that's the particular issue mm. with which um, um, you became associated in... From 1985 onwards. Um, I don't know whether you saw this document. I'm not sure that there's any evidence to suggest that you, that you did. I think um, I've seen it, seen it since, but I don't yes. think I probably saw it at the time. Uh, um, are you able to um, assist in understanding why there had been no public recognition of the, the fact that a number of haemophiliacs will die of chronic hepatitis? No, I can't really. I, I th I, my memory was, was that there was some, um, but obviously it was um, not remotely enough. Uh, but I can't really help you very much on that, I'm afraid. And then just the next paragraph, some patients are relieved of their symptoms, say of arthritis, by taking non-steroidal yeah. anti-inflammatory drugs, which can indeed cause death. I find it difficult to advocate that there are any special circumstances surrounding the care of haemophilia, which makes their case for compensation greater than that of other patients who take medicines which kill them. That is, of course, provided that doctors caring for the patients have prescribed their treatment in a proper manner. Now, we'll leave, leave aside that proviso, which is about what, what doctors did or didn't do. Um, so we see Dr. Smith is saying, I can't advocate any special circumstances. It, it doesn't appear from this or any of the other documents that there was any soul-searching on the part of the department to consider whether there had been not necessarily negligence, but fault or wrongdoing by governments, successive governments, the failure to achieve self-sufficiency in the 1970s or to recommission BPL at a sufficiently early stage, or, or anything of that matter, um, it, 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 that, that might have made the case for compensation stand out from others. Do you, do you know why that was the case? I would have, I, I'm guessing. I would have thought that the, ca the case was that they regarded it as a pretty hopeless, uh, hopeless uh, case to, to put forward. Uh, because um, if you had the Chancellor of the Exchequer against you, you had the Prime Minister against you, and you had most of the Cabinet against you, where on earth were you going to get um, 
um, um, a compensation scheme. It so, does work. So hopeless, not because it was an unmeritorious argument, but because no, the hope, no, absolutely. financial commitment wouldn't be there from the... the and they wouldn't, there wasn't the commitment, and they were all... And, I mean, you know, I'm not saying everybody was like this, but, uh, but uh, we, we, we as a cabinet... Uh, had been far, we were far too influenced by the argument, which um, yeah, from lawyers as well, uh, which was if we if we give way on this, you're giving way on an awful lot of other things. Um, now we we looked earlier at the social services select committee report yeah. um, and what they'd said about counselling, but they also talked about compensation. I'm, I'm not going to trouble you with looking at the detail of that, but. The position when you left office then in 1987 was essentially that which had been maintained throughout, which was n no compensation. I'm afraid it was. And there wasn't much... I mean, there was absolutely no chance of me uh, changing that policy, uh, even though it did manage to get slightly changed after I left, for various reasons I can explain. Uh, but I, I had... I had used up all my available capital by this stage, to be frank. Um, and uh, there was no other progress that I could make. Um, it was just after uh, uh, the Prime Minister had uh, rejected the uh, um, absolutely free uh, public uh, message that we could have, we could have made uh, as a government. Uh, we had used up all the available resources that were uh, for various uh, other pieces of expenditure. And... Um, uh, it needed a new, it needed, well, it certainly didn't, certainly there was no chance that I could have persuaded anyone. Uh, and you, you say, I think, I think again, for the, for the sake of completeness, you say in your statement that the move taken later uh, in 1987 towards making a special case for infected haemophiliacs and providing a form of financial support was the right thing to do. Um, uh, that you've observed in your statement in terms of the political realities, you're doubtful you would have succeeded in obtaining any level of funding in the way that your successor was able to because you'd largely expended your political capital yeah. with Number 10 and the Treasury by that time. Yeah, it's quite interesting what, the, uh, what John Moore did uh, because John Moore um, imme immediately um, uh, uh, issued, well, not immediately, but in a few weeks after, issued a statement of some kind uh, saying that he entirely backed what the pre previous government and the previous ministers had been doing, uh, because he had Tony Newton with him. And I don't think Tony's, <laughs> Tony's new views and mine were pretty similar. Uh, then two months later, uh, we had this um, uh, 10 million uh, scheme, uh, which was announced. Um, and that, I think, was because uh, the, the Tony was meeting the Haemophilia Society, and they were very worried about uh, what they were going to say. The only trouble with it was that, self-evidently, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be here, and, and well, perhaps we would, but we wouldn't be here on this issue, uh, 40 years later, it wasn't an adequate uh, scheme. It was a scheme. Uh, that uh, can't be denied, but it wasn't a very good one. Um, no, just t two or three remaining um, points um, from me, yep. Lord Fowler. Uh, if we go to your statement, Shamik, if we can have Lord Fowler's statement and go to page 18. In paragraph 0 0.36 of your statement, you, you've described um, uh, an, an occasion when you were, uh, uh, I think, ri writing a book on AIDS and you asked to see your own papers. Turned up at the Department of Health, taken to a side room, presented with three unsorted bundles of papers in no order. Um, and you noted a secretary had been taken away from her duties to watch you work. You say, this was the first time in my experience of writing three books that this procedure had been decreed. Normally, it was assumed if an ex-cabinet minister had been trusted with the secrets of Falklands, he could be trusted not to make off with what were arguably were his own, own papers. Um, did you inquire at the time, or did, did you ever inquire subsequently why this arrangement had, had been put in place? <coughs> I made a, um, uh, uh, <coughs> a comment uh, in uh, passing uh, to a um, health minister and said that I thought this was pretty extraordinary. I also thought it was pretty deficient as well because I literally went along uh, expecting, as I had for a previous, uh, uh, on a previous occasion, um, expecting the papers to be sorted out and in order, etc. 
And it was ridiculous. I mean, I had three great bundles of, of papers which were completely unsorted. Uh, some of them were quite interesting, some of them uh, 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 were not, and some of them obviously had, were, were altogether missing, which uh, it seemed to me that uh, uh, we had no system uh, uh, for storing uh, such things. And this was meant to be a campaign that had been successful, so goodness knows what we did for ones which they thought had been unsuccessful. Um, so it was quite evident that they didn't have uh, a system for for, for looking after it. Anyway, I said to the uh, minister uh, that this was uh, what had happened, and I mentioned the secretary, uh, because I'm not a particularly sensitive guy, but in fact the secretary looks over me to see what I'm going to do with him. It seems to be kind of pretty extraordinary. Um, and um, he said, yes, yes, he, he, he agreed with that. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the worst thing was that we were taking the secretary away from her other works. Well, you know, that didn't actually seem to me to be the reply to the issue that I was making. Uh, and I don't think there was any kind of great, uh, 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 great concern about this. Departments, let, let's face it, department, government departments are not concerned about um, ex-ministers um, writing memoirs um, which might contain themselves. Um, and they're not very uh, interested in um, um, history in any event, if that history happens to be uh, beyond the public relations uh, issues. So I think that all that kind of comes together to, ra to run a pretty awful system. Were you aware then, or, or, or have you ever become aware of any, any, any rule or policy regarding the, the maintenance or destruction of ministerial papers? And no, I don't, no I, know, I don't know anything of it. And uh, it's not altogether surprising because um, it's not really something which comes up when you're actually in office and you only see it after you're in office. And perhaps I should have actually raised it and, uh, uh, um, with the Secretary of State. I don't know who that was at that particular time uh, or the Permanent Secretary, but I didn't. And uh, perhaps it's all changed now. And perhaps with, um, uh, with the advances in technology, it's not quite so difficult anymore. Now, just turning to the question of, of, of an inquiry. Yeah. You, you've said in your statement um, that you advocated for an inquiry into AIDS in 1991. Yeah. Um, to, to whom did you advocate that, and, and, and what was the response? I wrote a book. Um, um, and if you'll excuse me, can I perhaps ask for the copy of it? Yes, of course. <coughs> there we are. Thank you very much. Thanks. It was a, a memoir of my um, uh, days as a cabinet minister with uh, Margaret Thatcher. And I wrote a book, and the, one of the chapters of which was a don't die of ignorance. Um, and what I advocated there um, was that there should be an inquiry into the whole area of health education, uh, which would um, um, examine uh, the effectiveness of our uh, current uh, approach, uh, approaches. And I made the point that it might seem curious uh, for sexually transmitted diseases disease like AIDS to be at the forefront of a much more general policy, but we might uh, remember that in 1916, the 1916 Royal Commission on Venereal Disease led to a free uh, public medical service. So these uh, advances do take rather uh, curious turns. But the idea, um, it was just an idea which I, I set out, and I think I set it out in a later work as well. Uh, uh, was that one should have an inquiry, not um, not to uh, not necessarily to find fault, but just to see what had happened. And actually, I would claim with AIDS, we got much of it right. And so you could look at what went wrong, and you could look at what went right. Um, but it should be a matter of uh, course that uh, when it came to the uh, end of that, that an inquiry was set up. What you didn't want was exactly what's happened in this case, is you, want, you went through year after year after year 
of people pressing for an inquiry, and then, frankly, because of a political convenience, uh, the government set up the inquiry. I'm making no, I'm making no, Sir Brian, uh, criticism of the way this inquiry has been handled, which I think has been handled impeccably, if I may say so. Uh, but it is a very curious way of going about things. And, but that is, uh, uh, has been uh, the, the way that it has happened. There should be, for some of these inquiries, there should be, should be automatic. There should have been an automatic uh, inquiry into uh, the handling of AIDS and how it was uh, done and its pluses and its minuses. Uh, because at the moment, I mean, you know, it, it affected the, those who were affected by it, the people who died, their families, and, uh, and that, which you're very well aware of. Uh, but it also affected um, witnesses as well. I mean, you've been asking me questions for a couple of days now um, on things um, uh, which would have been better answered by um, ministers who were actually in power at the time. Uh, but they're... You know, not all dead, but an awful lot of them are. I mean, Donald Atchison's dead, Tony Newton is dead, um, and, it, and so the, and John Moore is dead, and so, so the, the list, list goes on. And the, sometimes it's inevitable that you have an inquiry, you know, later on, um, because you have no alternative. But this wasn't the case here. You could have had an inquiry... Um, in, you know, 10 years afterwards, 20 years afterwards, 30 years afterwards. In fact, we're having an inquiry 40 years um, afterwards, which is the worst of every uh, conceivable world. And if I may say so, um, for, on behalf of the witnesses, I mean, it's one thing to give evidence at the age of 53 or 63 or 73. 83, you're beginning to push it a bit um, uh, with witnesses. Uh, apart from anything else, remembering what the hell was taking place uh, 40 years previously. So, uh, I'm afraid to say I think that there are deficiencies in the system, but I do underline the point that I'm making no complaint about this particular inquiry which I support uh, and which has been uh, impeccable in its uh, dealings with me. And you, you said in your statement that there was prevarication over many years over the holding of this inquiry. Was there anything in particular you had in mind when you used the word prevarication, or was it just the number of times successive governments, not just... Yes, yeah, successive governments, government. ...said no? No, I mean, I just think that... Um, um, I just think that it, was, it would have been in the public interest, and it would certainly been in the interest um, of um, those who had been affected to have had the inquiry much earlier. I, could, I don't know how many people um, died in the interim between 1985 uh, um, and today who have been entirely unaffected, have been entirely un uncovered uh, by anything that can come out of an inquiry. So I think there's a question of justice here um, which should be, should be addressed and I hope will be uh, addressed because it can't be a satisfactory position for anyone. You, I think, left office in terms of the Department of Health in June 1987. H had there been any consideration given by you um, or, or, or others, as far as you can recall, to the holding of a public inquiry at that point? Not by, no, no, not by me. I thought it was a mission impossible, mission hopeless. Um, and then um, I think you remained in that government until January 1990 as Secretary of State for Employment. D d did you raise the issue of holding a public inquiry or, or anyone else raise it whilst at that period of time whilst you remained in government? Um, well, I've, 1991 I did, but I don't think I did beforehand. And I certainly wouldn't have done it as, a, as another minister. I mean, that was by, by this stage I had handed over to uh, John Moore. Mm. Um, uh, and then... The, the last matter I want to explore with you bef bef before um, others have the opportunity to suggest any further questions to me is, is a question I have been asked by, by others to ask you. Um, it, it refers just looking to a passage of Lord Clark's evidence. So INQY 1000140, please. And it's page... 207, which electronically is probably about page 52 or so, Shona. Yeah. 
Yes, so if we look at the bottom half of the page, left-hand side, um, picking it up at line 10, this is what Lord Clark said to the inquiry, what I've had to put up with, and it exasperates me at times, is purely by chance I've remained the best-known person of all those people involved. I'm the kind of ageing, fading B-list celebrity now, the only people that the general public have heard of who were involved in Norman Fowler and myself. So there's a tendency for the campaigners and for the press to try to want to attach everything to do with this to me as though, because I was in the department at the time, I took all the decisions. If not me, Norman will have to do um, you know. And the people who try to influence inquiries are always trying to steer them to try to find some celebrity whose fault it was. And then he goes on to deal with a particular response that, that he'd made. It, it might be said that Lord Clark was complaining um, that, that he and, to an extent, you were celebrity scapegoats for decisions in which you had little involvement. Do, do, do you regard that as an accurate characterisation? No, but I regard it as an accurate uh, portrayal of Ken's views. <laughs> <laughs> And I think then just finally linking that back to something you said at the, um, towards the beginning of your evidence yesterday, Lord, Lord Fowler, um, whatever your day-to-day -day personal involvement, or indeed that of Lord Clark or any of the other ministers in, in, in the, the, the decisions, actions or omissions, I, I understand you to accept that ultimately responsibility for the department's decisions should rest with, with ministers... Uh, which would in, in, include, obviously, both the junior ministers, Lord Clark, and ultimately yourself. Yes, and ultimately, um, I was the Secretary of State, I was the head of the department, and, um, you know, if it, had, if it had ever come up, and I was responsible to Parliament, and if it had ever come up in the time that uh, I was sitting, then I would have uh, been accountable to that Parliament. There was no question about should be no question about that. I don't... I, don't, I mean, there was... There was a famous case, which I can't now remember, um, of a Minister of Agriculture or someone of that sort um, who established this. But, I mean, there shouldn't be any, any question about it. Uh, ministers, a great privilege to be a minister, but if you're Secretary of State, you take on the responsibility of answering for the whole of the department, even though you may not have any knowledge of that particular point. That's the whole, whole point about ministerial responsibility. Um, sir... Th th those are the end of the questions I was proposing to ask, but we do need to afford core participants the opportunity to suggest any further questions, um, and I would want a little time to consider that. So it, 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 we, can, we could come back at, in, in, at say, half past and, and finish... Well, I, I, I think we'll, we'll give you a, li a little bit longer than that, but subject to uh, Lord Fowler's views, let me tell you, Lord Fowler, what, what happens now. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the inquiry proceedings yes, uh, I have. before. Yes, I have then you, you may know that um, the core participants are, are not only entitled, but exercise the entitlement to ask questions through counsel for the inquiry uh, of their own uh, for a witness. Uh, and uh, we must give that opportunity uh, for of them course. to do so, particularly after having heard what you've, what you've said as, as a total to her. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know uh, how many questions there will be or how long there will be. Uh, there may be none. That's unlikely. Uh, there may be a, a great number, I, I don't know. Um, it'll take a, as long as it takes. So if we come back, let us say, at five past, so, um, so 45 minutes uh, from, from now, uh, let's say 20 to four, Yep. Um, I can't promise that you'll be finished by half past four. You may it well be. No, but, uh, we're so near, I think, the end that I think it's, it's ridiculous to... Well, that, 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 thank you for that, but it's, it's your decision and you're no, no, entirely absolutely. free to choose. Absolutely. Uh, then we'll do that. Thank you, sir. So, 20 uh, to 4. Thank you.